Um, I only ever went to Reflections once, and that was, I think, after it had moved to the new location. So I never actually went to the old Refle Reflections, which was, I think, on Salter Street. But I do remember walking by there as a teenager, because I lived out in Timberley, which is a ways outside the city. It's incorporated into HRM, but it's one of those like little towns that just kind of got tacked on afterwards. And so my sister and I would take the bus to come into Halifax on the weekends, and, you know, spend our pocket money, like mostly at Freak's Lunchbox, honestly. But I would always make a point of walking past the outside of Reflections because it was one of the only spaces, even one of the like only like LGBT spaces in Halifax that actually had the flag flying outside. At this point, this is like just the standard like six stripe rainbow flag rather than the progress one or anything like that. And it was really important for me as a teenager to just walk by and see that and look up at it and be like, okay, so there, there is a place that I can go when I'm old enough. Cause I was too much of a goody two shoes to get uh, a fake ID or anything like that. I was just like, ah, oh, 19th birthday. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out there. As it turned out on my 19th birthday, I was uh, working at a Christian summer camp. So I could not go to the gay bar. <laughs> um, but having it there and being able to see from the outside what it was, was really important to me. And Venus Envy was kind of the same way as well because they were one of the other few businesses that actually flew the flag outside. And I could actually go in there because they had like, you know, the, the rule that only 18 and up people could come inside, but they never asked for ID or anything. You could just come in and browse the books if you looked young and they wouldn't, they wouldn't get weird about it. And that was really important to me too. Like being able to go into a space and see a shelf labeled like queer young adult or something like that. And being able to find those books that I could almost never find at, at my school library, at my local library, even going to a, another kind of. Uh, my name is Elliot Gish. I'm a librarian, I'm a writer, I'm a big old homo, and a thousand other things. Well, originally I was in, I was from Dartmouth. When I was younger, that's where I lived until I was about six years old. And we moved out to Timberley around that time because it was still when they were kind of, you know, just handing out mortgages and houses to people very freely, which is the only way that my parents could get one. Uh, so there's a new area over in Timberley that they were developing. So we moved out there and I lived there until I moved away for college. So until I was about 17 years old, I lived out in Timberley. Um, and that was, it was almost like a, a throwback kind of neighborhood. Like people were really trying to, you know, bring back this old school idea of the suburbs and, you know, Tupperware parties and you know, all the kids playing on their bikes in the street and that kind of thing. So it's very, it's almost kitschy feeling like that. But I mean, all the buildings were new. It was a very new, new space, but there's definitely a feeling that, you know, we want to keep the spirit of the suburbs alive in Timberley, which was great for me as like a very young child. Not so great once I got to that like grumpy teenage phase. Like once I hit 12 years old, you know, you get into that very grumpy, like I hate my hometown, I can't wait to leave sort of headspace. So I got, I got there quite quickly, <laughs> especially being, you know, a little gay teen in the suburbs. It's not the, the best environment to be in. I think probably the first time I consciously realized that there was something up with me was when I was in seventh grade. I would have been about 12 years old. And I remember I was just sitting at my desk in school. I was in French immersion. And there was this girl in front of me. She was waiting to speak to the teacher. And I was just kind of looking at her like, okay. And then I realized that I was looking at her and sort of realized from that realization why I was looking at her. Because at that point, I knew that gay people existed. I didn't know a lot of the specifics, but I knew that there were gay people out there. And I just got so flustered and overwhelmed that I just went to the bathroom immediately, locked myself in a stall and had a little panic attack. I tried to talk myself down to being like, no, 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 that was just a fluke. That was just some weird fluke. You just caught yourself looking at a girl. It's fine. It's fine. It's not going to happen again. And then it happened again, <laughs> lots and lots of times. So at that point, I was, I, I knew the term bisexual, like, cause at that point, Angelina Jolie was really popular. So I was like, Angelina Jolie's bisexual. I guess that must be what I am. Cause I hadn't even like done, I mean, I was, I was 12. I haven't really done the work of unpacking, you know, heterosexism and compulsory heterosexuality and all that stuff. So I was like, probably I'm going to date men because everybody dates men. Like that's just, you know, that's just my future. 
Sure, when I think about having to do that, eventually I get kind of bummed out and like I'm trapped and suffocating, but like probably that's gonna be like what I do and it's gonna be fine. So it's just like, yeah, you know, I'm, I mostly like boys, but also just find myself happen happening to stare at girls all the time. Like that's, that's normal stuff. And uh, then in ninth grade, uh, my last year of middle school, I was 14 years old. I made a uh, female friend for the first time in a long time because after having this little, this little revelation in seventh grade, I tried very specifically not to be friends with girls because I was like, oh, that's going to be, that's going to get dangerous and weird really quickly. So I just tried to avoid other girls. Um, but I made a friend and very, very quickly uh, found myself, you know, have, developing a crush on her and didn't handle that super well. <laughs> Just because I, I, I thought that I'd had a handle on the whole sexuality thing. And then it turned out that the feelings that I had for this girl were way more powerful than what I had thought of as crushes on, you know, boys that I knew growing up. Because I'd always thought of a crush as something that you decide to have on somebody. Like I remember in second grade, I decided to have a crush on a boy named Grant because he had a rat tail and I thought that, that was really cool. So I was like, that's the boy that I have a crush on, I've decided. Whereas... This time around with this girl that I had a crush on, there was no deciding. It was just like something that happened to me versus something that I specifically tried to make happen. Um, and even despite that, though, I didn't figure out that I wasn't actually bisexual for many, many years. <laughs> there was still that feeling of, well, you know, I'm probably going to like date men eventually because there's no avoiding it. It's just, you know, something unfortunate that happens to every girl. <laughs> but that really should have been a bit a bit more of a, not a red flag, but a bit more of a sign to me that maybe that wouldn't be in my future. That, you know, I had to try really hard to be attracted to boys. Well, um, I remember it, was, it wasn't very long after I had that first like panicky moment in seventh grade that I came out to my parents. I think it was maybe a year later. And my parents had a very like European approach to alcohol in that if they had wine with supper, they would let us have a little bit, like once we hit our, our early teen years. And so we, it was Easter supper and we were all having wine and I had a little bit too much wine at like 13 years old. Not, not much wine is too much wine. And uh, I was like, well, I'm, I, have, I have to tell you something. And at that point I came out to them as bisexual. And I think my mother was very relieved that that was what I came out to her as uh, because that still meant that I could marry a man and have lots of babies. And so she could have lots of grandchildren, right? So there's still, she was still holding out hope. Um, I'd come out to my sister a little bit before that. And I remember that really distinctly because we'd been watching a film called uh, The Glass House, uh, early 2000s Lily Sobieski movie. Not a very good movie at all, <laughs> but she does spend the majority of the film in a white tank top. So, you know, at the end of it, I was like, oh, Karen, I have to tell you something. And she was very like, she was a little bit wary, but also very intrigued. Like, oh, okay, so like, so, so you like girls then? Yeah, yeah, I think I do. Like how much was I think the question that she asked, which is kind of funny in hindsight because all of my sisters ended up being bisexual. <laughs> I think I was, I was 20-ish when I realized that dating men was not actually something that I wanted to do. Like I'd never actually done it, but I, you know, moved through life assuming that eventually, like probably I'm going to have to do it and it's going to be a thing that happens. And then when I was 20, I was like, wait, I don't have to do that. And I don't want to do that. That's amazing. So really almost like a backwards way of coming at it versus like you hear a lot of bisexuals like kind of growing up thinking that they need to be one thing or the other. I kind of grew up thinking that I had to be both and then realizing that I wasn't. So, but I didn't actually, like from then on, I would use the word gay, I would use the word queer, but I didn't actually start thinking of myself as a lesbian until I was 20, 26 years old. So like quite, that's quite advanced, you know, from when I initially came out as, you know, some kind of something. I remember I was at a friend's house and we were watching a film and he said something about the, the male lead in it being really attractive. I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't really, I don't really get that he's attractive. And he looked at me, he's like, of course you don't get that he's attractive. You're a lesbian. I was like, oh yeah, I am a lesbian. 
Like, it wasn't until then that I kind of, like, put all those pieces of the puzzle together. It's like, oh, right, that's the word. Because, of course, growing up, like, where, the, where I went to school, like, they didn't really use the word queer as a pejorative thing. Like, the words that they use if they really wanted to hurt your feelings was gay or lesbian. Like, being called a lesbian was, like, one of the worst things that you could be called. And I got called it a lot as a young thing because, you know, people clocked me way before I clocked myself. So people had been calling me that for, for years and years. And it wasn't until that moment that I was like, oh, they, they were correct. You know, there's a little bit of a, a stubborn resistance to that word specifically that had been kind of built up from just from those early experiences, I think. Whereas now I'm just saying lesbian, lesbian, lesbian everywhere. Like, probably too I sort of worked from the assumption that everybody was bisexual, but from coming at it from a bit of a, a funny standpoint, because I was like, well, you know, obviously everybody must love girls, because like, girls, have you seen them? But you know, so many, like almost all women are like dating men, so probably everybody's bisexual and they just don't talk about it. So that was kind of where I was coming at it from. It's like, you know, clearly everyone must like women. So everyone must be bisexual. <laughs> There's some very special logic at work there. Uh, I went to Ridgecliff Middle School for junior high. And then I went to Sir John A. Macdonald for high school. Uh, after high school, I went to Memorial University of Newfoundland for, well, it's supposed to be a four year degree, but I did it in five years. So, you know, real go getter. And then I came back here to do school at uh, Dalhousie for library science. So I came back to Nova Scotia from, from Newfoundland for grad school in 2013. And at that point, like I had never really lived like an out life in, in Halifax at that point. Like I hadn't been somebody who could go to a gay bar or was able to participate in a lot of community events because I left Halifax when I was 17, or well, left HRN rather when I was 17, because I never lived in Halifax proper. So by the time I came back for grad school, I was 24, 25 years old, and sort of able to go to a lot of the spaces that I'd sort of looked at from a distance as a teenager for the first time ever, um, at least in theory. So that, that was kind of weird, like coming back to coming back to this place that I had only experienced through like the odd like weekend trip into the city and just from passing by different spaces and looking longingly through the door at anything that I knew was any kind of queer space. I was able to actually go into them now and participate. I was a grad student, so I didn't have a lot of time to actually go into them and participate. <laughs> um, but at that point, 2013 was when I came back to Halifax. So there were a couple of different options at that point. Um, Men's and Molly's was still open. That was the, the bar down on Goddard Street. There's also the company house down on Goddard Street, was, which was like a, a de facto lesbian bar, kind of more of a pub than a, than a dance bar. Um, Reflections was open, but at that point, Reflections was in its new space. And it also wasn't really a gay bar anymore. Um, I think it's, it was around the time that they switched locations that they really started de-emphasizing the, the queer community and sort of emphasizing that they were just, you know, an everyone is welcome space, which is fine, um, but also not really what you're looking for if you want to have like a fun gay night out. Um, so yeah, by the time I came back, I was mostly going to, uh, I was going to men's primarily and the company house as well. So those are the two sort of spaces that I frequented most when I came. Well, I think unless you specifically make it a queer safe space, then it's not going to be that. Like, unless you specifically say like, no, this is a space for the community, by the community. Like other people are welcome as well, but like specifically, this is our, our turf, so to speak. It's not going to feel that welcoming. Like I've, I've been to other bars, of course. I've been to other dance bars in the city and a lot of them do purport to be very welcoming but there is a very conservative element in a lot of the crowd that goes to them where like frankly in a lot of dance spaces in Halifax whether they purport to be welcoming for everybody or not 
like it's not safe to dance for a man to dance with another man in a lot of those spaces, regardless of what the intent is of the owner, it's just based on the crowd. So I do tend to shy away from going to a lot of spaces that aren't explicitly queer these days. If I want, if I want to dance, if I want to get a little bit silly, just cause it doesn't feel safe necessarily to do that. Even in spaces like, uh, say the seahorse down on Gottingen, which is like, it has been historically a very like queer friendly space. I still don't feel 100% comfortable there a lot of the time because there's, there's often like an element of bro-ishness there and a sort of, you don't necessarily feel like you're the person who's meant to walk through the door, even when they don't turn you away when you do. When you walk into a place and you know that you're maybe not explicitly unwelcome, but definitely not the people that the, the people who are running the bar had in mind when they built this space. It feels very much like you're intruding and like you're there sort of on sufferance. Like you can, you can come in here and you can, you know, be gay or whatever, but don't be too gay. Like don't, don't get crazy with it. Just, you know, be like, low background hum gay instead of, you know, front and center gay, which is, it makes a huge difference, you know, and it definitely, I think the way that I behave in those spaces is very, very different from the way that I behave in explicitly queer spaces, because I'm very aware of the fact that to an extent, I'm in the space based on sufferance, you know, like I'm there as long as they, as I can be tolerated. And past that point, there's, there's no guarantees. And you know what? I wonder sometimes if that is, if that perception of the spaces that I go to is accurate or if it's more of a holdover from just sort of the trauma of, going up, of growing up queer in quite a, a fairly conservative area, you know, just always knowing that you can be yourself, but there's, there's a limit. There's a limit and you gotta make sure that you don't hit it. Uh, well, Company House, was it was very low key. It uh, had these huge windows that were looking out onto Gottingen Street. So I remember I went there one year during uh, during Pride just to watch the parade and sit there and have have a beer by myself. And it was a very um, it was a very relaxed atmosphere. Uh, there was a kitchen there. They would uh, do appetizers and nachos and that kind of thing. They would turn it into a dance space from time to time. But for the most part, it was more of a pub atmosphere than anything which was great, that's, that's often the kind of atmosphere that I'm looking for in a queer space, is a more convivial space where you can just sit down with friends and have a conversation without screaming over the music. Um, men's was right down the street. Men's was a shithole and I loved it so much. <laughs> I had to go up these rickety, rickety stairs to actually get to the dance floor. There were, several, there were three different rooms. One was the sort of main dance area. It had a little stage where drag queens could perform and it had a DJ booth. And uh, one of the rooms is sort of a, an enclosed space where bands could perform. A lot of bands played at men's. And then there was a, almost a sort of really rundown lounge on the left-hand side when he came up where there was a pool table that had seen not only better days, but better decades. And uh, there's a little second bar there that was never as fully stocked as the main bar. And I remember I went to men's one night and I saw like three juggalos walk past me into one of the, one of the enclosed rooms. And I was just like, what is happening? Like people in full it? clown makeup, like, so a juggalo is a fan of the insane clown posse, which is a band. And they tend to go about in uh, full clown makeup. And so there were just these three people walking by me in full clown makeup. And I was like, oh, well, I, I have to follow these people. I need to know what's going on. And I went into this enclosed space, which is usually where, where bands were, would perform when they went to men's. And there was just, it was a full room full of people in clown makeup, just a full juggalo party happening in men's. And I was like, this is, it, it was absurd. It was ridiculous. And I was like, this is the best night of my life just seeing this happen but that was the kind of space it was like I think the owner the owners of men's tried really hard to um sort of separate the association of gay bars with 
crime, because as you know, there's, there's quite a strong association between the two in Halifax still, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I think because of that, the owners really tried to make sure that the bar was sort of diversified and had, you know, things like musical acts coming through and they would rent out the space to people for parties and that kind of thing. So they tried really, really hard to keep that bar afloat in a legitimate way. So one of the other things that I loved about men's is that there was always somebody working coat check who would serve you shots. So like it was, you know, a coat check slash shot bar and they all had funny names and they were like made of the most ridiculous, sickening mixes of liqueurs you could think of. And by the time you got to the coat check to take your coat on your way out, you were, all, you were sauced enough that you were like, another shot sounds like a great idea. And that would be what would kill you the next day. You do a shot on your way out of men's and that would, what would give you the worst hangover the next day. There was also in the, in the, the main dance space in men's, there were a bunch of posters on the walls that would advertise different things. Like a lot of them were for gay cruises. And I remember one of the posters for a gay cruise, it just featured sort of like a, a generic looking like kind of twinky guy on it. But he had this giant tattoo like right here of corn, not the, fr not the, not, not the vegetable, the band, like the it was so distinctive. And anytime I was in that space, if I could just grab a table that was really close to that poster, I would, because it was, it really encapsulated what the bar was about. Because this was an old outdated poster. I don't even know if that cruise line existed anymore by the time we were all going there, but it was so, so much its own space and so distinctive that like, you couldn't help but love it. It was like, kind of like the cranky old uncle but a bar, like your cranky weird uncle who like lives in a trailer and like shouts at the moon kind of thing. That was the vibe of men's. <laughs> oh my God, it was so dirty. It was dirty all the time. But like that, that felt like home to me because um, not, not because I'm personally very dirty, but because the first gay bar I ever went to was actually in St. John's. I was 20 years old. Uh, I had, you know, I had not gotten a fake ID and gone to any bars at all. It was just, you know, me waiting until I was legal to go into a, a gay bar. And I didn't have any friends in St. John's at this point. So it was just me like really nervous, like pacing back and forth in front of a bar called The Zone, which was the only gay bar in St. John's at that point, trying to like work up the courage to go inside by myself. And The Zone was another one like up at the top of a really rickety flight of stairs a tiny like dirty dance floor. If you fell down and your hands touched the floor and you got back up and you looked at them, they were like black and dripping with some kind of liquid that you never knew what it was. So that was my first gay bar experience in St. John's and led to me like meeting a lot of people and getting like a really great friend group there. So a dirty, disgusting gay bar, that's, that's what I like. That's what makes me feel like, a I don't know what it is, but. <laughs> See, see, I think that's the problem with reflections, right? They started washing their floors too much and that's how you know it's not a gay bar anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, there is that historic connection between gay bars and the mafia. Like back when it was, you know, still illegal to be gay and to, you know, go around doing gay stuff in public, gay bars still existed, but they were technically illegal depending on what went on with them. Like you, it was illegal for, you know, two men to dance together. It was obviously illegal to have gay sex. So you had to be really careful with what went on in your establishment. And a lot of them were run by the mob or the mafia because of that. Um, because, you know, these were vulnerable people who would be very willing to, you know, pay up in order to have these spaces. And you could also make a lot of money off of them. Like people would go to a bar that, you know, had ridiculous drink prices and really strict, you know, criteria for entering and, you know, kicked you out every other week because it was the only gay bar in town. So they would keep going there. And I think that link is still very much alive in Nova Scotia. Um, particularly there's links with uh, gay bars and the Hells Angels. And there we have that link quite, quite explicitly with uh, reflections. Um, yeah, but I think that it's still very easy to exploit us because we're just so desperate for community and camaraderie and just being able to be together in a space that oftentimes we get quite desperate for it. And I think that you can kind of see that a little bit with uh, Indulge, the gay bar that is the only gay bar now in Halifax, because it's not, 
Yeah. It's it's not queer owned and it's not very good and the music isn't very good and last time I was there they ran out of drinks on on Pride of All Nights. Like that's when you stock up, man. But I think we are all so desperate for a way to be together that we will really take anything. And I think in a way that's that does lead to us being exploited quite a bit, but I also think that it's kind of beautiful, you know, like in that we just want to be together so badly and we want to be able to live and dance and breathe in the same space that we will accept a, a dirty gay bar floor. We will ex accept weird liquid dripping off our hands when we accidentally touch the floorboards. We will, we will accept juggalo parties and gay cruise posters, you know? It's all part of the experience. Uh, I work at Halifax Central Library as an adult specialist, which means that I primarily plan programs and uh, put on events for the public. And that's been, it's been a really great excuse for me to do as much gay stuff as I want to do. Because uh, um, I do sort of have free reign to sort of create whatever events and programs I want. Uh, my manager's really understanding and really uh, laissez-faire with that kind of thing. So this year, I think I ended up doing like, gosh, at the end, 10, 10 to 15 Pride programs, something like that. So we had a lot going on, which was amazing. Um, and it's, give, it's made it a lot easier for me to connect with the community as well. Uh, like I recently did an event with um, Rainbow Refugee Association of, Association of Nova Scotia. That was a human library. So LGBT folks from all over the world came in to tell their stories. They were sitting down and people would come up to them and ask them questions really in a really respectful and really affirming environment. We we're just talking about, you know, what is it like to be gay in Iran? What is it like to be, you know, trans in Syria? What is it like to be a lesbian in Mexico? That kind of thing. And there were some really beautiful conversations that came from that event and some really lovely and unexpected moments of connection between, between different people as well. So I'm hoping that I can continue to use that position to do more stuff like that and sort of put on more, more events that are not just, not just for the community, but of the community. I think it's important for there to be more spaces than just bars for the community, partly because other, other communities have all kinds of other spaces where they can gather and they don't have to rely on bars and we shouldn't have to either. Like, I love a gay bar, but that, I don't want that to be the only place where I can ever meet other people who you know, are like myself. And of course, there's also the aspect that if the only place that you can meet folks from your community is in a place that serves alcohol and where consuming alcohol is basically a requirement of being there, that's going to foster probably an unhealthy relationship with alcohol and an, un an unhealthy relationship with substances in general. So it's really important to have spaces and events for the community that don't focus on that, where you know alcohol isn't being consumed, where it's not an option to, to drink, for, especially for people who have those complicated relationships with, uh, with alcohol or other substances. It's really important to be able to relax away from that, if that is something that is an issue for you. And I think, I think we all know that it's an issue that sort of disproportionately affects the community. I know even just anecdotally, I know a lot of folks who do struggle with substances, especially alcohol. So being able to have spaces where you don't have to worry about that being an issue is really... I mean, it's been a journey, definitely. And I think the city has... It's changed a lot in the past 20 years or so. Because that would... Oh gosh, that's about the time span that I'm thinking of, right? From from coming out around the age 12 or 13 to now at almost 35. Oh God. Um, I think hmm, we've gotten a lot more open-minded as a city. I think there's a lot more openness to people from the community participating in public life. Um, I don't think it's perfect by any means, but even just looking at some of the kids who come into the library, because of course there's always a lot of queer kids that come into a library. It's kind of a safe haven. And just seeing how open they are with each other and how proud they are of their identities and how vocal they are about their identities is 
really amazing to me because I remember when I came out at that quite young age, I came out by saying, well, I don't know if I'm gay or not yet, if people asked me. And that was enough to sort of get me ostracized versus now it seems like it's a lot it's a lot more, it's within reach for a teenager to say, yeah, no, I'm gay, I'm bi, I'm pan, I'm trans. Like, that's something that you can actually do. Not to say that there's no difficulties associated with being part of the community anymore, but it seems like people are coming to their identities much younger and understanding themselves much more fully at a younger age and not waiting until they're 26 to realize that they're a lesbian. So I think that that's really great. Um, For me, growing up as, you know, a young queer person in Halifax, it often felt very, very lonely, especially where I was living primarily in the suburbs for most of, most of my teenagehood, most of my adolescence, rather. Um, I didn't know many other people who identified as any of the letters at all, and... Um, those that I did find, I really clung to. I had a couple of queer friends and they, they were sort of my everything. I was active in uh, my school's GSA. We were actually, uh, I was actually one of the founding members of the GSA. Um, but I remember there were quite a few of us who were active in the GSA. A lot of us were sort of put, putting ourselves forward as allies or just there for our friends. We weren't. <laughs> it was not an ally situation, but it was much safer to just say, well, you know, I have a gay brother or I have like a bisexual cousin or whatever, and that's why I'm here because I want to be an ally to the community. But I remember we were planning a field trip at one point, like the, the GSA was, and we wanted to go see some kind of gay film. I don't remember what one it was, but there was one that was playing in a, uh, it was playing at the Scotia, what's, what's now the Scotiabank Theater out in Bayers Lake. At that point, it was just, I don't know, it was Empire Theater something or other, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, but we were planning on going to this theater for this movie. And the administration told uh, the school nurse, who was who, like the adult that ran the GSA, well, okay, you can, you can take them to the movie, but it can't be a gay movie. And she's like, well, what, what do you mean? Like, that's what they want to see. They can see a straight movie any day. And they're like, well, you know, it's really just, it's, it's too risky, you know, to take them to see that. Cause you know, we don't know what the parents are going to do. And like, we, what if it's rated too high? She's like, I'm not going to take them to see a porno. Like, what are you talking about? We eventually got, got permission to go to see the film, which was, uh, it was a documentary, I believe called Jim and Bold, which was about uh, a gay high schooler who committed suicide in 1997. So quite a grim watch, but that was, at that point, that was what was sort of available to you as, as an LGBT teen. It was stuff where people either die at the end and the audience is supposed to learn a beautiful lesson about tolerance because this person is dead, uh, or eventually it turns out that they're, they're not gay after all. That was kind of what was available to folks. Like... It's interesting to think about where media was at that point, because I remember when I was younger, like the big gay couple in media was um, Willow and Tara from Buffy, because they were like the, the one of the first like primetime lesbian couples that have, had ever really existed. And it was a huge deal that they were on the show that was aimed towards teenagers. And spoiler alert, Tara ends up dying. And I remember watching that when I was 13 years old and going, oh, Okay, I thought that they were going to be a lovely, happy couple and things are going to end well for them. Well, then I guess she's dead now. And that was what you had, you know? Like, I remember when I was around the same age, I think 14, 15, I was looking in HMV for any movie that had any kind of gay theme. I, didn't, I wasn't picky. I didn't care what I got, just as long as I found something in the sale bin that, you know, was gay-ish. And I ended up finding a, a VHS copy of Boys Don't Cry. I did not know what Boys Don't Cry was about exactly, but I was like, okay, this, I know that this is gayish, so I'll, I'll buy this and take it home and watch it with, you know, my candy that I got for Greek Lunchbox and it's gonna be a great time. It was not a great time, because that is one of the grimmest movies ever made and ends in the, the trans person in it being murdered. So, as it turns out, I'm not the only 
LGBT person in my family. Um, I had three sisters. Uh, one of them, my older sister, is bisexual. Uh, the sister who's young, who's a couple years younger than me, is also bisexual. And my youngest sister, well, I mean, we thought for years that she was my brother, but then she came out at age 16 as transgender. I think she was also pansexual, but that doesn't really, that, that didn't, that wasn't as big a deal, of course, as coming out as trans. That was the big thing, right? And And in September of last year, so September 9th, 2022, uh, she, she killed herself. She died by suicide. And so it, it is still really bad. Like it's better than it has been for a long time, but I think people really need to realize that being seen a certain way, the pain of be of having your identity rejected, the pain of having family reject you, it's it's very serious. And I think there's a tendency to hand wave about that kind of thing and say, oh well, you know, it's better now. There's gay marriage, it's whatever, like everybody's fine. But everybody's not fine, you know? And all the it's it feels sometimes almost embarrassing to still have feelings about oppression almost you know what I mean like it's almost a cliche a little sad about maybe like having lost time because of homophobia and transphobia but having lost relationships having lost connections with people who you thought you'd be connected to forever it, I think there's a tendency in the community especially to sort of joke about it and to make light of those experiences and that's fine like that's one way for us to get through but I think it's also really important to recognize that that pain is very real and we need to honor that and just come to it from a place of love and know that a lot of us, no matter how much we joke about the things that we've experienced, so the people that we've lost, we're, we're not okay, you know, in our, not to be, you know, cliche, but in our hearts, it, that pain is still there. Uh, when I moved to Newfoundland, uh, I think my third or fourth year in St. John's, I got engaged to a person who was very, very bad for me. Um, it was a very abusive relationship and it continued after I moved back here for grad school. So the two years, the first two years that I was back in the city, I was in an abusive relationship. It, it lasted five years, all in all, almost five years. And that was something that really impacted my ability to interact with the community as well, because I was with this person who, she was very jealous, she was very controlling, she didn't really want me to have gay friends at all. Like, she, she really hated other gay people, it was very strange. Um, but because I was, you know, very traumatized by that experience and very much in a, a you know, people-pleasing kind of panic mode the whole time that I was in that relationship. I listened to her and was not friends with very many other people in the community at all. And it was, that was very, very isolating. And it wasn't until uh, we broke up in 2015, September 2015, that I really started going out and experiencing more spaces and making more friends and making more connections in the community and really sort of living my life instead of a shadow of my life. But the reason why I bring that up is because that person was named Amy and my current partner is also named Amy. So that's where that came from. That's Well, I think one of the weirdest things about the experience of being in an abusive relationship when you're an LGBT person is that all the resources that exist aren't really for you. Like I could find lots and lots of resources about how to get away from an abusive man as a woman. There was nothing really out there about getting away from an abusive woman as a woman. There's really not that much. And that made me wonder for the longest time if what I was experiencing was actually abuse because, I mean, 
this girl was, she was smaller and more delicate than me. She was much more feminine. She was like a goth vegan. So I was like, surely this can't be a person who could abuse me. I'm just misunderstanding the situation. I'm just not trying hard enough to make things good. And if I tried harder, then everything would be fine. And that was kind of what I went on for years. Even as some people who were close to me would check in and say, hey, I really didn't like the way she was speaking to you the other night. I didn't like that, you know, you had to like lock yourself in a bathroom to cry at this party. I don't like that she made you leave this event early. I don't like what I'm seeing in your relationship. And I just thought, well, you know, that's, it's, it, this can't be abuse because this isn't what abuse looks like. So that was very difficult to come to terms with. Even now, like sometimes I'll tell a story about that relationship that I think is really, really funny. And people will look at me like, oh my God, that happened to you? Like at one point, uh, she gave me some pills. Uh, I thought it was for a headache, but they must have been, I think they were expired or something like that because I got very, very loopy very quickly. And I said, I think those pills that you gave me were expired. And she looked at me and said, I didn't give you any pills. What are you talking about? And I told this story to somebody saying, oh, isn't it funny that I thought that she gave me these pills, but obviously something else happened that ended in me taking these pills. And the person I was speaking to just looked at me and was like, you know that she gave you those, right? Like she was gaslighting you about having given you those pills. I was like, oh, okay. So it's not a funny story. It's like a sad trauma story. Damn, I have to reconfigure my whole life now. I mean, I don't want to say it gets better <laughs> because that's such a cliche at this point, but you're going to live a much wider and more beautiful life than you think you're going to. Like you're going to experience so much and you're going to have so many beautiful days and so many terrible days and it's all going to add up to something wonderful. So just don't give up. Oh my God. What would I tell baby me? You're gay, stupid. Probably would be the first one. <laughs> Like revisiting my uh, my seven year old self who's just like staring at Princess Leia in Star Wars. Like, oh, I'm really interested in that person for some reason. You're gay. You're gay. Um, partly that. Um, but I would also tell myself that that's you don't have to feel ashamed of that, and you're going to spend a long time feeling ashamed of that. And I wish that you wouldn't because there's nothing wrong with you. You're annoying and cranky all the time, but there's nothing wrong with you. That's just because you're, you know, a teenager. Uh, my first Halifax Pride memory is from 2004. I was 15 years old and I, I went into the city just to, to watch the parade. I couldn't go to any of the after parties. I couldn't go to any bars. I was too young, but I just wanted to see the parade go by. And I remember looking around and thinking, wow, there's so many people here. Like, is like half of Halifax gay maybe? I still kind of think that. And I remember at one point there was a drag queen who caught my eye while I was just standing on the sidewalk as a sad little baby gay, like getting rained on a little bit because you know, it's Halifax. And she blew me a kiss. And I can't remember what her name was. I don't know if she even still lives in Halifax anymore but that meant the world to little baby me. She was blowing everybody kisses, so it wasn't like I was special, but I felt very seen in that moment that somebody saw me on the sidewalk and was like, this one needs one. Mwah! That was lovely. Uh, I also remember going to Halifax Pride in 2007, and it rained all day that year, like a morning to night, and I was, oh, I was dressed in this ridiculous getup of like these huge, huge baggy pants and an enormous uh, tank top that said freak on it. I don't know where the hell I got it. And I think I found a dog collar somewhere and was wearing it and just ridiculous, ridiculous outfit. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, she was involved with the youth project a little bit. I never went to the youth project as a kid, but she, um, she got involved with them a little bit for their, their pride performance. And they did a pirate themed dance to uh, Grace Kelly. Oh, yeah, that's a very distinctive memory that I have of Halifax Pride is standing in the rain, watching my girlfriend at the time dressed up as a pirate, like dancing around to Grace Kelly in the middle of a field. 
So the current climate is very, very strange to me because it does feel in a lot of ways that we've come full circle. Like I remember being terrified that, you know, people would find out about, about me being terrified of, you know, being seen with too much gay stuff. And it seems like that fear is very much coming back. And the emphasis now that's on drag in particular, but also like trans people specifically is, it's bonkers to me. Because we do drag queen story time at the library fairly frequently. And every time we do it, our community navigator has to call and get increased security because every time, like in the last couple of years we do a drag story time, we get threats about people like saying that they're going to come in and disrupt it somehow or people saying that the library is, you know, full of groomers or, or whatever. And it's just absurd. And the way that that rhetoric has exploded in the last couple of years is also absurd. And it's so, it's so transparent. And it really, it really bothers me that I feel like there aren't enough of the other letters paying attention to the transphobia specifically that's so en vogue right now. Because even aside from just, you know, it's the basic human thing, like the basic human decent thing to, you know, care about the other people in your community. I think there's some people who don't realize that, you know, nothing is gonna be contained to one group. What they think about, what these people think about trans people, they think about all of us. So we really, really need to be united here and show up and just get our heads out of the sand and stop thinking that, you know, stop thinking, fuck you, I've got mine, you know? But yeah, it's, it's disturbing the way that people are reacting to, like you said, just putting on makeup and a dress and reading a book to a kid. Like, what, where on earth is the harm? Like, what is happening with these people? What is happening in their brains? Oh, man. It's, and yeah, I think about, I think about the way that the climate has changed a lot in, in relation to my sister and how painful it must have been for her to just, she was very, very online. She was on the internet a lot. Most of her friends were folks from around the world like that she mostly knew through the internet. And how painful it must have been for her to, you know, log on every day and see stuff that specifically said, you're, you're a danger to children, you're evil, you're wrong. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous that this is still happening. <laughs> and that, you know, when we think about it, it never really stopped. It just, you know, changes shape every now and again. Like in the 70s, there was, a, there was panic about, you know, gay teachers. That even continued into me being an adolescent. I remember there was a case with a teacher in a school in HRM who she was accused of, you know, behaving inappropriately with a student, not by the student, by some other, by some other student who, you know, inferred that because this teacher was a lesbian, she'd done something horrible. And I think she lost her job over it too. It was a whole thing, but anyway. So it's just the same stuff dressed up differently. It's, you know, they're not calling us perverts now, they're calling us groomers, and they think that that gives them the moral high ground. But it doesn't, and also when you look at the actual facts of who's grooming who and who's, you know, actually mistreating children, it's not us, you know? It's, it's pastors, it's the Catholic Church, it's, you know, babysitters, it's family members. Like, those are the people that you have to worry about. Not somebody wearing a dress and reading like Heather has two mommies to your kid. <sighs> those, are my, those are my feelings on the subject. <laughs> and like, just one more thing, sorry. <laughs> also, I feel like there's this idea that if you can somehow shield your children from any pernicious like queer influence, then they'll turn out not queer. And that's not true because sometimes kids are just gay. Like that just happens. Kids are just gay or they're just trans or they're just bi. It's just a thing. And there's nothing that you can do to stop that. Like banning Entangle makes three will not make your kid any less gay if your kid is gay. So chill out.